Hi guys, it's Lauren. Welcome to, welcome back to my channel. And in this video, I'm going to be telling you the story and the unsolved murder of Kate Teal. So without further ado, let's get into the video. This case took place in 1909 in St. Louis, Missouri. Kate Teal was a part of a house divided into several different apartments and she had chosen one on the second floor in the rear part of the house, if that makes sense. And there was also a balcony attached. She was known to be a big drinker and she actually lived there because there was a saloon right across the street from her apartment. She would go to the saloon several times a day with a bucket and she would fill the bucket up with beer go back to her apartment, she would drink for hours that day, and then once it was empty, she would go back to the saloon, fill it up, and it was just a repeating cycle. So months before the murder, she was actually super close with her husband, but he unfortunately passed away from natural causes, and he was quite a bit older than her. She had propped him up in a chair next to a fire and put herself in a four-day drunk stupor before finally reporting his death. She told the police that she was afraid that they were going to bury him in a potter's field, which if you don't know what that is, it's basically when the city or county buries someone with no money and does it very cheaply. And so that aspect bothered her. After his death, she had taken his two small dogs. Her friend ended up taking one and then she kept the small brown dog and they were both very noisy dogs. Friday, June 4th, 1909, Kate had failed to come out of her room to go to the saloon and get a drink. Mary Lucka, or Luca, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it, lived across the hall from Kate, and she became very worried about that observation. Kate's dog had been barking all night, and now it's gone into the next day, and Kate had not come out of her room at all. There was no sign that she had even been like up and about inside of her room. Mary knocked on the door, but there was no response, except for, of course, the dog barking. And then she tried to open the door, but it was locked. Her second idea was to go to the room next to Kate's that was vacant, and luckily for her, it was unlocked. The balcony attached to that room was connected to Kate's balcony. So Mary went into that room, went onto that balcony, climbed over the railing to Kate's balcony, and peered through the window. What she found was Kate Teal laying in her bed face up with blood everywhere. So Mary had notified the police. The lead detective was Sergeant Smith with the St. Louis Police Department. He tried to enter through the main door to Kate's apartment, but it was still locked. So he ended up forcing his way in. The room was a mess. The closet was ripped apart. There was garbage all over the place. And like I mentioned, Kate was face up on the bed covered in so much blood and she was actually also holding a butcher knife. First, the police thought that this was suicide. I mean, she was holding the knife, but there were two narrow stab wounds in her body, not large ones like the butcher knife. Not to mention, the knife was completely wiped clean and had like no sign of anything on it. Like there was no blood whatsoever. The body was then taken to the morgue where it was examined by the coroner's jury. Sergeant Smith did not think that it was robbery. Um, Kate really didn't have much, and the room did appear to have been searched. Other tenants in the home, which I'm going to try my best not to butcher these names, if I do, I apologize. Feel free to correct me in the comments. But it was Mary Luca, or Luca, Mike Machinica, and 12-year-old Ava Dayton. And they were all taken to the station and basically arrested on the spot and taken to questioning. Officers find out that Kate had actually been dead for around 36 hours by that point, which means that it had most likely happened just after midnight on Thursday. The night before Kate's murder, which would have been Wednesday evening, three witnesses had walked by her door. They all said they saw John DePorto, one of her friends, sitting with her. They were drinking beer from a blue bucket, not the normal bucket that Kate normally used. Ava was the most notable witness. Even though she was only 12 years old, she did know John and she would have been able to easily recognize him. Officers searched other tenants' rooms, but they came up empty. They did, however, find a gold cufflink in Kate's room that they assume was probably dropped by the killer. They looked everywhere to see if they can find another one, but they had to let the tenants go because they had zero evidence. Now here's what we know about the weapon. 
It was a very unique knife. It was about 1 inch in diameter and 12 inches long. As far as injuries go, she had two stab wounds. One went through the eye and through the brain. The other one was in her side that went through her lungs and piercing her heart. One suspect is John DeBorta. Like we said, he was seen in Kate's room and they were known to be friends. He was 24 years old and worked at Tam Brothers Glue Factory. It adjoined the house where Kate was living and John denied any involvement. In fact, he actually seemed almost surprised by Kate's murder and so they decided to search his home. They found a coat that had stains on the sleeves and they were wondering, okay, is this blood? Like, is this the smoking gun, so to speak? And then they also found the blue bucket that Ava had described to them. So they really had no choice but to arrest John on the spot. Charles Alwyns was also taken into custody. Supposedly, he was telling people around town about how much money Kate had in her room. When questioned, Charles said that he is a partner for the saloon that Kate had regularly went to, and he claims that he did a job for Kate three weeks before her murder. I guess she needed a screen door hung, and when she went to pay him, she pulled out a bunch of large bills out of a jar. However, he had a decent alibi for the night of the murder, so he wasn't really a suspect at this point. They were just really questioning another person of interest. I don't know. He was also asked if he told anyone about the money, and he said he did not. Supposedly, in the little time that Kate was not drinking and was not drunk, she would talk about her money and herself. Police were skeptical because she had a watch that was handed down from previous generations in her family and she would use it as collateral for loans. In fact, her main source of income when she wasn't pawning off this watch was her wealthy brother. He would send her money to basically keep her on her feet, but he did refuse to send her any more than she originally asked because he knew that she was just going to spend it at the saloon and didn't want to provoke that behavior. Days after the body was found, police let John DeBorda go, and it turns out that the stains on his coat were not blood stains. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. I know that was like a very abrupt ending. That was really all the information I could find on this case, and to this day that murder is still unsolved and it's still a mystery. So let me know what you guys think down in the comments below. I think all the people that were questioned, minus the 12 year old girl, were possible suspects and people of interest. And there were just some odd details here and there where I'm like, okay, that's a little weird, that's suspicious. So let me know what you guys think down in the comments below. And thank you guys so much for watching this video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up, disliked it, Give it a thumbs down, I don't really care. Subscribe if you're new, comment down below videos you would like to see next. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.